perfect H5 replica. I hadn't seen a replica that ever really did justice to the Halloween 5 Michael Myers mask. God bless Silver Champagne Novelties um, making the movie molds available to us. Best of the best, definitely. Um, but then I just found myself thinking and just through my own just not willing to settle or some form of my obsession with that mask in particular um, and just the very unique way it all came together um, as I'll talk in more detail later about the nose appliance and all the rest of it I think and I truly believe it's the hardest Michael Myers mask to replicate perfectly the only way I was going to get the perfect replica was to create it myself with my own hands. I'm a novice. I've never sculpted anything in my life. Um, I wanted to create the perfect H5 screen used hero replica. I was, uh, I was quite afraid at the beginning. Um, afraid of failure. Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm the hardest on myself. My biggest critic, I felt compelled to get my hands in the clay and do it myself. And I had also, along with that, the fear in my belly. It was, it was also very primal. Just, I knew exactly what I wanted. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew my goal. And I was not going to rest until it was perfect. I just was not going to compromise with this project. Regardless of me being a novice, regardless of this being the first piece I've ever sculpted. I was going to do it in a way that it's never been done before. And I think I've accomplished that. I want to say for episode two, there was footage missing. There was a few hours of footage, two to three hours of footage. And, uh... I just, I had to shut down the camera and just really get in the zone. Uh, I was getting very emotional because it was at the beginning of the process. And like I said, I'm a, a very harsh on myself. Uh, obviously at the very beginning, it looks like nothing. And I, I just had to get it to a, do it to a place where I'm like, okay, this is starting to look like something. This is starting to look badass. I can do this. Um, and after that, there were no times where I shut down the camera. Sometimes I was so deep in sculpting that I would run out of footage or run out of space, but I would never um, shut it off because I didn't feel confident. Um, this, this session was very important for me to share with you guys, even in the way that I did. It's a little different than the first episode, but, um, this was a very important, uh, session because I, it was that first time where I finally, I felt that confidence for the first time that, okay, I can do this. I can sculpt this myself, um, and accomplish this goal. So it was very special to me. I kept that going for the entire uh, pursuit of the project. Once I made that choice to put my hands in the clay, I kicked it into high gear. I started with obviously organizing all the reference photos uh, that I had. Um, and then I decided to get a little more technical with it. And I also built digital sketches myself. It was a good warm up for me. It was a good visual warm up. It was a good technical warm up. Um, I looked at uh, also um, facial proportions, just in general. I researched, I did some research on that. I read up uh, just some basics on facial proportions. Um, finding the center of the face, uh, where the ears are supposed to sit, where the eyes, you know, etc. That part, I would say, you know, I don't know if you want to call it pre-production, pre-clay, you know, the ref picks, the digital sketches, um, looking at 
all the replicas I could, um, including uh, the SSN Shanks and the uh, Revenge, uh, which are the best of the best because they are movie mold. Um, this is just a different conversation. As I, as I said, I, I, there are reasons that those masks still didn't satisfy me at the end of the day. So that is why this project exists and came into fruition. I mean, I, I looked at everything I could, man. Every single thing. If you want to achieve perfection, you must know your subject inside and out. Do your research. I wanted to understand all the specifics, the dynamics and mechanics of the piece that I was trying to reproduce. I asked myself what specific aspects produce the H5 look. The exaggerated and extra long backslit it was almost at the top of Don Shank's head, the cut of the neck. The thickness of the poles of the screen used masks, they were thin, paper thin. The details of the paint job that go beyond the outlines of the movie mold used. The eyebrows are specifically their own creature on that screen used hero. They are wild, they are unique, and they are strange. And I've never seen the eyebrows painted correctly to reflect that strangeness. It's a very specific look. It's not just, oh, you paint them closer together, you make them look more mean. It's very specific. The left and the right eyebrow are not symmetrical at all. Finally, the way the actor's head and face shape affected the appearance of the movie mold. The way it rested on Don Shank's shoulders. The way it pops out the sides, both left and the right sides of the mask and the ears. That was all based on the backslit and how it fell on his head and his shoulders. You always want to utilize movement when you're observing, adding, or taking away from the sculpt move around the sculpt on foot around the table. Act as though your eyes are a camera, if you will. Observe the sculpt from higher and lower angles as well as mid angles by kneeling, crouching, getting on a chair even. Um, you can even move the armature the sculpt is situated on around with your hands. Carefully watch the sculpt as it moves and make calculated decisions as you take in the visual cues and information of every angle, curve, and feature of the sculpt. The anatomy of the ear was an interesting one for me. Um, I hadn't ever paid attention to the detail of the human face in general. Like I said before, I studied a little bit about uh, anatomy of the face. Um, the features, just the way the movement, the way the structures, the way the structures interacted. And uh, when I got to the ears, it was really interesting. I was uh, wowed by the detail and just the rhythm of the ear and the shape. And it's, it's a very interesting structure. The session came together uh, very surprisingly. I'm not going to say easy, but it came together very nicely. Uh, in one session, I essentially completed both ears. The other thing I want to mention here, while we're talking about the ears, the back slit being all the way up to the, practically the top of the head, changed the angle and the look of the sides of the mask, which include the ears. So, they popped out more, if you will. They protruded more. And I noticed this in reference uh, footage from the movie, and I also noticed this on all the behind-the-scenes footage that I could get my hands on. Um, those ears were just popped out. You know what I mean? They were protruding to the left and to the right. I wanted my replica to reflect this information and to reflect that look. Because I think the ears are something that you can easily miss. I think, I think they're just taken for granted. Uh, nobody really gives a second look or a second thought. You always want to think in 3D. Um, always think in three-dimensional terms. 
Avoid becoming too obsessed or focused on one view or one angle. Um, always remember that a sculpt must look perfect from all angles. There's also a unique and specific interaction between what I call a trinity of sources, which are number one, your eyes. Number two, still pictures. Uh, and number three, video, how it looks on video and film. Use the three sources I mentioned earlier, being your eyes, pictures, and video of your sculpt as you create it. All three sources will achieve a sense of congruency. Through at least one of these sources I've listed above, distortions and inaccuracies will be aggressively revealed. Um, our eyes are deceiving and will constantly move to find the angle or spot where the sculpt looks its best. And this is where the other two sources, in addition to my eyesight, came in. Still pictures and video are truly unforgiving and honest as they will show all limitations and distortions occurring in the sculpt at any given time. In terms of sculpting the eye cuts, uh, I began with guides uh, made out of paper, essentially what I thought I wanted them to look like, or where I, what I thought they would look like, and I placed them on the sculpt. I traced them a number of times. I remember the weekend when I was doing uh, the eye cuts and eyebrows, and it just wasn't wasn't hitting me. Similarly with the eyebrows, that uh, strangeness and spontaneity in the paint job, it was never expressed properly in any replica I've ever seen. Um, and I just thought it deserved that attention. It deserves to be shown as it was on screen. People get caught up in one angle or one picture or the fact that the movie mold has the eyebrows in it and they, they paint those the way they are. And I'm here to tell you, these eyebrows were not painted according to the mold. They were their own thing, their own creatures. And that's why the uniqueness, the strangeness, these words I use, people miss it. And it's not for any reason, it, it, it's right there in the pictures. All you have to do is see. And I find many people look, but they don't see. This, uh, this session was really cool because it was one of the shortest sessions, but most important. I had what I call a flash, where you, if something snaps in your eye and you finally see something for what it is. I looked at the lips, one morning, and I saw what I had to do. I knew that they weren't symmetrical. I knew that most of the pictures, they were washed out. Uh, they look paper thin, but the opposite is true. I have many pictures of movie molds, can be movie molds uh, throughout the community, previously owned a Shanks, and I just, I love that mask. I've always had it. That's what got me into the whole hobby to begin with, was the SSN Shanks. All the features, all the beauty of this mask, really, not many people know about it because a lot of the shots themselves of the screen-used mask are washed out, so you can't see the greatness. And I wanted to give some of that uniqueness, the asymmetrical nature, and the meanness. A lot of the look comes from the lips. It's a whole look, guys. It's that unique. The brow was another uh, dimension of this. The, uh, the V in uh, the upper brow area um, above the eyebrows. Um, the musculature there. Um, it's another factor that is completely missed, again, because of the washed out promotional photos. Most replicas I've seen make this mask look extremely one dimensional and uh, flat. And I wanted to bring a little bit more detail, a little bit more uh, character to the brow as well. Um, I seen that there's the V there. For me, it was a factor that kind of resonated and I wanted to bring some 3D life to it. This was also the time where I came upon the idea of 
becoming embedded. Now, when you're embedded, it's almost like a state of hypnotism or just distraction over emphasis on a certain angle or a certain picture or a certain ideal or even a piece of knowledge or research you've acquired because you start seeing things you start you're not clear anymore um, and I would also recommend taking some time off once you if you hit areas like this and it starts becoming frustrating you want to take some time away refresh your eyes you want to clear your mind and clear your eyes and come back and uh, tackle it again. You have to really know when to push and when to quit. I've never seen the jaggedness and spontaneity and strangeness of the eye cuts of the Halloween 5 Myers mask done with pure screen accuracy. It was tough. It was done with such spontaneity that it is that much harder to capture in a replica. This was where I really started to dive in again, back to the eye cuts, and my my perspective was shifting as I learned more, as I got more sculpting hours under my belt. Um, I was thinking, how am I going to build them inward? The lips are another thing that never get enough attention. People assume they're paper thin, uh, it's, it was more the, the way they were painted, very subtly, and it was also the fact that most of the promo images um, are washed out. I am assuming, and this is an assumption, but I think it makes sense, the set was very dark. And so I think a lot of the clearer, brighter promotional shots were done with a flash, a hard flash, because it was so dark, and as a result, the mask became washed out. The lips, they look almost as if they're non-existent. All the features, all the beauty of this mask, really, not many people know about it. The neck on this mask is another factor that is hugely overlooked, mostly for the reason that it is hard to control the appearance of the neck, Especially if you're making latex masks, because it is about the way the sides of the mask protruded out. So the look of the mask was altered from the original movie mold. It never appeared as it did when it wasn't being worn, or as it appears on the SSN Revenge or SSN Shanks. It was a little more flared out um, in the natural mold, definitely, and, and that flare is reflected in the final on-screen look, but it's more straight and uh, has a very unique character. Now here is where I hit full stride with the eye cuts and the idea of how to make it look like an eye cut. I started really producing okay here's the edges of the mask I started going inward I understood finally how to make them look like eye cuts as you can see and it was very exciting for me after all that trial and error a lot of 10 steps forward and 15 back but um, it was all worth it man uh, I wasn't gonna let that stop me so and it was super cool at the end of this session. It, it looked like it never looked before. Um, it was a really special session that way because, because that confidence and, and the knowledge I was attaining with each passing session was starting to show. As you can see, it, it really changed. It really started to come into its own. And I felt like, wow, I made that. Uh, this is amazing. Smoothing is an essential part of the sculpting process. As you build the shape, you have to smooth the rough areas out and the pieces of clay into one structure. I found myself being satisfied uh, many times uh, in its rough state before smoothing, but after smoothing it would always reveal limitations or areas that required more attention. 
So this is an essential part of the entire process. Um, I, I smoothed countless times throughout the entire process. It's not very interesting to watch, but I felt it was necessary to discuss the technique and its importance throughout the entire process. This is where I came up against a struggle of a very subtle detail, mostly in the profile. The nose was not sitting perfectly with me. It was really coming into its own, but there was still something off. And it vexed me to the point of having to cut the appliance area, essentially, the nose and the lips, off several times and reattaching them. Just general repositioning and retooling, if you will, of the look of the uh, appliance area and how it affected the rest of the mask. I was really having difficulty with the profile. The, the nose was such a tricky, tricky thing. And I, I really can't say it was just that. It, every single little aspect of this getting it to that ultimate balance was very tricky. And once I started getting more experience into my belt, I, I had my first case of embedding kind of being kind of hypnotized or obsessed with one idea and you kind of you go too far I went too far with the nose right I then I stepped back it's part of the learning process it's always going to be part of the sculpting process it was so much trial and error here are a couple uh, versions of the metamorphosis or the retooling stages I went through guys um, I was still not satisfied with the general placement of the nose and lips. So I was trying all kinds of different things to see if I could shake it up um, and achieve balance. I just had to take the plunge and give it my best shot here. I noticed even the space between the lips and the nose uh, themselves also needed a little bit of tweaking so I started getting in there and experimenting a little bit with that I was always trying to think outside the box and never lose hope I was determined to find that ultimate balance here there was a little bit of retooling the left eye cut after giving attention to the facial structures the neck needed to be retooled and readjusted and needed to be balanced out. Even the uh, length of the neck uh, was also adjusted. Uh, the back of the skull or head also matters. You have to think, once you put the hair on, how is this going to look? If it's an awkward head shape, there is a high chance that the hair might look awkward. So essentially, the head shape matters. This session was focused on the placement of the right eyebrow. I had to slightly adjust where it landed. Um, it was a little too close um, to the middle, to the bridge of the nose, to above the bridge of the nose. So I cut it off, all the while trying to maintain the actual shape of the eyebrow because I was very happy with that. And I placed it back on and smoothed it back over in a space that really started tying that look together. The screen accuracy for the eyebrows, this was a huge adjustment to push it even further in that area of screen accuracy of the eyebrows. This session I had to focus on getting the lips back up to par after about five or six um, nose or appliance area uh, surgeries, as I call them. Um, I had to get them back up to par to where I had them originally um, because some of the structure was lost. Figured I did it once, I could do it again. Never lose your cool, guys. Always be positive and always remember, have fun while you're doing this. It's always about having a great time at the end of the day. And never forget that. What I'm working on today is the placement of the ears. This is when I ask myself the question, what sources are truly correct? Many times camera angles are deceiving, and these angles I'm speaking about definitely change the look of the mask in the reference pictures and footage I was using. I found out that the ear placement was lower on the mask, 
and I made that necessary adjustment. It may seem like a small adjustment, but once I was done, it blew me away at how a simple aspect that many people don't put weight on, the height of the ears, the placement of the ears, they're, they're not thought about. It's very passive. The ear placement is actually very important to the final look. And I was blown away at the end of this session to see that it got that much closer to perfection just by lowering the ear placement. I was pleasantly surprised. Here I was engaging with the neck shape and overall length, always taking an overall look at the balance of the mask and the on-screen goal. It's another factor that I find people take too passively. They put the flare, they put the big neck, and that's it. I wanted to put a little extra love and attention to all the aspects of this sculpt and do it like it's never been done before. I've never seen the neck of this mask exactly as I've seen it on screen. It's a very simple goal I had that I kept reiterating and it kept me grounded and centered throughout the entire project. Even when I was stepping out of bounds with the look, I always came back because I knew exactly what I wanted to do and I wasn't going to settle with any aspect, even as something as simple as ear placement or neck shape or neck length. I was not going to compromise. And I was so happy it was translating in the sculpt, this determination I had to produce what I saw on screen. It was invigorating and fantastic. And wait till you see what happens next. Here I started to mix the more traditional look of the neck with the flare, um, with the on-screen look. On the left side specifically of the neck, instead of building outward and adding clay to create a little bit of distortion in the latex, a little fold, if you will, that happened because it was sitting on Don Shank's shoulder and it was folded. Instead of adding, I decided to go inward. I carved into the mask to create that distortion. It was an experiment. It wasn't hitting me the way I wanted it to, so I was driven to try something completely new. I also started on uh, the dividing wall lines. Another detail that's on the screen used hero. Um, as you can see it in many of the scenes, particularly the staircase scene. And uh, I wanted to represent that on my sculpt. Uh, just little details like that. Uh, I find, as a fan, I find that little bit of extra attention and those extra details just blow me away as a fan. So that's what I wanted to do. This time I was playing the uh, balancing act again. After I cut in for the next shape on the left side to express that distortion, I had to balance out the, the back of the head area as it was a little lacking a little bit. I also did some more work on the dividing wall. I wanted to make it more distinct looking. Um, wall being subtle. I was experimenting with, with pliers. I was exper experimenting with trying with my hands and just with a bunch of different techniques with that and I think I've achieved the look I want with that. It was in the screen used hero copy so I wanted that expressed in my replica as well. I also started giving a little love as the face was being balanced out. I uh, took a couple of shots at the chin, added a little bit there, a little bit of character, a little bit of thickness. It was a little weak at this point so I also went at that and I was pleased at the end of this session. It was looking very mean. The three dots on the neck. <laughs> I am unsure if a lot of people know about this marking, this very subtle marking. You can see it in the movie uh, on that stairs scene again, which is one of my main goals. That, that look is a, a big, big look for me. So you can see it there. The light, uh, the way the light hits the mask does reveal this marking in the mold. It's very, very cool. Did I need to put it in? I felt I had to express this little marking. I thought as a huge fan, a colossal fan of the H5 mask, this just 
makes me feel warm inside. It's so cool that this is expressed on a replica, on a ground up sculpt. As you move along in the project, you look again at the footage, both behind the scenes and the movie footage. It's really interesting because you, you see things with new eyes almost every single day you look at it in this kind of detail. I felt the cheeks and the bridge of the nose needed a bit of attention, so I did that. Uh, the bridge of the nose was a bit thin in the facial shape in general, uh, the cheeks and whatnot. I wanted to level that playing field. And then the forehead V, I wanted it to be a little more aggressive. Um, I still wasn't happy with where it sat um, because I didn't want it to be too jagged, I didn't want it to be too soft. But I took a few more steps in the right direction with that aspect and I was happy with where I ended up. After putting so much love and attention into the upper lip, into the detail of the pictures and the various poles I have seen, um, I wanted to give a little extra attention to the lower lip as I thought it was a bit thin and lacking in dimension um, and the idea of it being perfectly imperfect. Um, it was a bit too symmetrical for my taste. I managed to thicken it up just a bit, made it slightly asymmetrical. It immediately uh, resonated with me and I thought long and hard about this because I was, I almost considered it done at this point, but I, if there's something that vexes you guys or that does not sit well with me anyway, I have to rectify it and um, engage with it. Usually it works out where it actually very much improves the piece. Here I want to reiterate that there's a constant dialogue that you must have with yourself. You want to make sure you choose the best direction for each and every creative decision you have made. I recently spoke about uh, thickening the nose. Here I realized I just went a bit too far. So it's a simple aspect of thinning the nose down. The nose is, is it's quite elegant on this mask. It's not big at all. Many times the size of the H5 nose has been misrepresented. So I paid very close attention to that. I also pushed the right ear inward. They do protrude, as I said previously, because of the size of the neck slit. They did protrude out, but I went a little too far on the right, so I just pushed it in a tad and it came out shiny. It looked great. Sometimes you go five steps forward, 10 steps back, but here I'm also gonna reiterate, it's a constant dialogue with yourself. I had to readjust the shape of the back of the head, also a little bit of the back of the, the neck. Um, it was a bit too extreme. I did not want an awkward shape. Sometimes you go go too far and you have to take it back just a little tad and it's just part of that artistic discussion. I find this in all art, I find this in my music, I find it when I paint, and when I sketch. I found it in acting um, and I found it in sculpting as well. Or sometimes you go a little too far, a little too over the top, you gotta take it back a bit. So it's just part of the artistic conversation. Okay guys, gut check time. Last but not least, little finishing touches here. Now as I bring this to a close, um, there is one big detail that I decided not to put on this replica. And I wanted to address it before the series ended because the questions will come. The wondering will come, especially from hard H5 fans. Many people are gonna be wondering where the appliance line is. Um, the uh, nose and lip appliance line. I have mentioned it many times in the documentary series, but I decided not to express it on my replica because when I watch the movie, and when I look at the promo shots, I do not see an appliance line. Now, it doesn't mean it's not there. There is one little shot where I saw it, uh, and it's still very faint. The main idea I had was the screen-used mask is not every replica I've ever seen. Replicas are replicas. The screen-used mask is found in the behind-the-scenes footage, the on-screen footage and the promo images or any images you can dig up. 
I wanted to represent my replica as what you see on screen. And to me, in my opinion, I do not see that appliance line. So I did not express it on the replica. That was a genuine and purposeful artistic decision on my part. And it's okay if people disagree with it. This is how I decided to do my interpretation of the screen used hero. And I'm very proud of it. I, um, I also, as this is the last episode of the series, I wanted to thank everyone who watched. I am so happy that I got to share my entire experience here with you guys. I did not plan this uh, when I was filming it. I wanted it just for me as a little time capsule, um, but I, I found myself wanting to share. I was happy that I had this platform to uh, share this with you. I will be continuing the process. The sculpting has finished and come to a close. The next steps of this project would be molding, casting, painting, and hairing. And I will be sharing those steps as well with you. This journey is not over. It continues and I shall bring you guys on that journey as well. Thank you so much and happy Halloween.